I'm going to read a quick um, intro. And um, yeah, well, so welcome family to Colonial Outcast, a very dysfunctional renegade podcast that your grandmama warned you about even before there was the internet. Uh, I'm Mark going solo today as Greg is dealing with technology issues. Joining me today is Waleed Rashid, known for his perfect jawline. Waleed is a badass <laughs> Palestinian American activist, entrepreneur, and a ton of other things we're about to get into. Um, for our uh, uh, Muslim audience, um, Aid Mubarak. Um, hope uh, everybody had a good Ramadan. Um, and so with that being said, it is April 11th. Um, and welcome, Wally. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Doing good. Just uh, just been a busy day. Yeah, but it's glad to be here. Awesome. Uh, I've been a huge fan of you for months. Um, I consider you a hero in many respects. Uh, there are a lot of heroes that have risen um, to the cause throughout all this. And uh, you're one in your own vein. Uh, what stood out to me about you as well, uh, besides all the content that you push out, um, that reaches uh has been reaching a huge audience and that i'm very happy for I'm, I'm glad a lot of people are seeing your your content um but there was also something about you that i gravitated to um i guess you would say in a kindred spirit type of way um was that you and i shared a common element in our development as a as american men and that is the west bank and we'll get into that uh further in um it's something that you know, um, I was able to relate to you uh, in a way that I don't relate to most people because uh, a lot of Americans, most Americans don't know anything about the West Bank. And it had a huge impact on me. And in some type of way, you and I um, have that intersection uh, in the sense that the West Bank kind of changed who we were and who we became. Uh, you know, um, I believe you went only uh, just a few years ago. I went there when I was 18 years old, back in 2005 and six. Um, but uh, I'm going to read a quick, uh, well, not quick, but uh, I want to get into your bio a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so uh, Wally, you're an entrepreneur and online personality, currently based out of Florida. You hold a biology science degree from University of California, Irvine, uh, not too far from me, with a background in medical research at Stanford University. You're the founder of Woodland Pulse. Uh, planters and garden e-commerce store. You're also the founder of the All of Peace Foundation, a nonprofit organization focused on U.S.-based policy reform. And you recently launched your latest venture, Aero Chronicles, a flying car and aero vehicle news website. That's pretty cool. You were born and raised in Minnesota with extended family in the West Bank. Both sides of your family are from the same village, Burin. Uh, the West Bank. Yeah. Uh, Burin. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you come from two generations of refugees. Your grandparents escaped the West Bank in 1967, leaving behind much of their family. Your dad's parents moved to Jordan and your mom to Kuwait. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, your fa your mom's family escaped and then moved to Jordan, uh, where she met your dad. Your dad moved to the States when he was 18 years old. Uh, his first job was a manager at McDonald's. From there, he kept working in the restaurant industry, eventually opening up a restaurant of his own and got into real estate. Growing up, you and your family would spend summers in Amman, Jordan. You've always wanted to visit your family's village, but they were too worried about what would happen to you if you did. You had your first visit to the West Bank a few years ago, which was a life-changing experience after staying with extended family. We're going to get into that. The first hour you were there, the settlers of Yitzhar uh, came, in, came down and attacked your village. They began setting crops on fire and raiding the village. The IDF eventually came, and instead of helping, they enabled it. The IDF implements fear tactics on Palestinians of the West Bank. So when they arrived, they stormed the village and kidnapped uh, the neighbor's son next door. Um, and we're going to get into that. From that point on, you became very involved in the Palestinian cause. And that's when you really began to strengthen your relationship with your extended family there. We're going to dive into all that. Um, it's, it's a lot to get into, um, but it's yeah. <laughs> the, the audience needs to hear all of it. Yeah, and I'm excited to hear about how... Um... The West Bank shaped you too. I didn't realize it had such an impact on you. That's awesome. I'm excited to hear it. It did. Um, yeah, believe it or not, um, it's what I think it was kind of like the catalyst that really tipped me over the fence to being pro Palestinian at, at a young age. Uh, because prior to that, I was the most fanatical pro Israel American you've ever met. 
oh, you know, when I went to Israel. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, uh, I was that guy. I was that evangelical guy. Is that why you brought you there? You were on like a religious trip? Uh, I, it wasn't a religious trip. It was the, um, my senior year of high school. I told my parents that I wanted to go study in Israel hmm. and they said, okay. Uh, so they, um, I went to Hebrew university and, uh, they sent me off. So I was, it was at U Utah is where I was living prior to that. I was on a military base in Utah. We call it a civilians call it area 52, uh -huh. you know, okay. uh, but we would call it Dugway, Pro Dugway proving ground. Um, so I wanted to uh, get out of the States and go to Israel to study. So they uh, sent me off and, um, I went to Hebrew university in Jerusalem and that's when my journey started, but I just did, I was doing, I was going solo. I it wasn't through any type of church trip or any type of program. I didn't know anybody there. Uh, but you know, I just wanted to go alone and just, uh, so in a ways it was kind of like a, a religious pilgrimage for myself to go and explore my belief system and get to know my own faith from my own, you know, experience alone as a young man in a foreign country, um, in the Holy land. Yeah. And it wound up going down a path that I never expected it would take me, which was my walk with the Palestinians. So I tell people constantly that my journey to becoming, um, more connected to my faith as a Christian, was my journey with the Palestinians. Oh, wow. they, they wound it up becoming one and the same. So I, I try to tell that story as often as I can because my Palestinian friends tell me to tell it. So um, I'll keep on repeating it on any turn that I take in this um, and being in the public sphere in any type of way. So, uh, but we'll get into the West Bank um, uh, in a minute, my experience, but I want to get dive into yours. Uh, but I want to say this, um, what strikes me about you in particular is I see you as uh, an omen and a symbol and promise for Palestinian youth. You like, I, I see this youthful hope on your face, you know, um, you remind me very much of my younger brother. Like you, you even look identical to him. Like you and my, if I, if my, if my younger brother was sitting next to you, you guys would be twins besides the hairstyle, That's about <laughs> it, you know? So I, I very much, you know, maybe that's it too. I don't know. Uh, maybe subconsciously that's playing a role. Uh, but the, you have a very innovative attitude and a drive to unlock the future. That's, that's how I see it, you know, and seeing the uh, pro Palestinian movement and how it has unfolded and has convinced me to believe that the Palestinians will be the ones leading uh, humanity down a new path that deviates from the destructive path that imperialism would have us take were it not for them. So, Wally, to me, you are a, a harbinger for a coming age. I appreciate you it. Know, if really that makes any sense. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea if any of what I just said makes any sense, but it's the best way. No, I, I do. It. I appreciate so, it. Yeah, but um, let's let's uh let, let's get into your childhood growing up um what what has it been like being a palestinian american yeah uh well i grew up in minnesota so it's very it's predominantly white i grew up in a suburb of minnesota and growing up i think a lot of minorities actually connect with this which wasn't too much of an issue but i definitely was very trying to think, I guess the best way to put it is just very whitewashed, uh, very unaware of my own culture. Uh, and I had no issues with that really growing up. There were times where I would feel different. My name is Walid, Walid, but I've been going by Wally for as long, for so long now. Uh, I, mean, I figured I, that Walid was your, your, yeah, you caught name. it before I even <laughs> mentioned, so you got it right. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, growing up, I, yeah, I grew up in a suburb. All of my, I played baseball, hockey, pretty, pretty standard, honestly. The only times there would be sometimes I would really feel different, um, just like certain occasions when it came to my name or certain aspects of my culture. But I, um, I had a pretty decent ch childhood. I wasn't that connected to, and I think this is just my personality because I grew up in America and everything. I wasn't, I didn't have that many other Arab friends. The majority of my friends were actually all white, um, just growing up in the suburbs. 
And it wasn't until really, honestly, after high school that I got a lot more connected to just, you know, my roots and Palestinian cause. But uh, growing up, I would spend summers in Amman, Jordan. Every couple every couple of years, my family would uh, bring me to Amman. My grandma used to live there at the time. And actually, both sides of my family, we have a lot of extended family there as well. So I would spend the summers there, a couple months uh, growing up, meeting, staying with my grandparents, um, you know, hanging out. And I've always wanted to go to Palestine. I always wanted to go to the West Bank. But they would continuously tell me no, just because they were in fear for my safety. Um, but that's, yeah, that was pretty much my childhood. So I guess just a standard Arab American childhood. I would go back to and visit during the summers. And that was about it. Yeah, it's you said uh, your parents were worried about your safety and for good reason. Um, obviously, we we had a example of that happening to an American Palestinian who um, traveled to get, I believe he was shot in the head um, in the vehicle. Yep. Uh, they claimed he was throwing rocks. It was very um, eye-opening to see the lack of response by the American government, knowing that a, a American was American. killed by IDF soldiers in the West Bank. So, yeah, I, I can completely understand your parents' worry. Um, you So you had an experience at the West Bank. Um, what what Can you walk us through that? that that timeline yeah yeah so i wanted to i've been wanting to go back to the west bank especially after uh 20 2021 was the last prior to prior to everything going on in gaza now i think when 2021 happened and there were those attacks then that really affected me um i was actually in med school in dc at the time and that just shattered me um, and I felt like I was so shattered and I was talking about it on social media. This was before I had my platform and everything else. And I felt like I couldn't, um, uh, I felt like nobody could understand what I was going through at the time when I was in DC, I was living there by myself with my med school friends. And there was, uh, it affected me at such a deep place. And I had such a hard time trying to explain that to other people. So that was, that, that was a very, um, life-changing moment for me because that's kind of what really kick-started my desire to want to know what's happening and know where I'm from and know what's going on with my family. So my mom, she uh, was going to visit her, her mother in Amman, Jordan, and uh, she asked me if I wanted to come with, and I said, yeah, that's fine as long as I get to go back and visit our family in Budin in the West Bank. And, and she agreed. So um, yeah, I was in Amman for a few weeks first, and then I decided to go visit my family in the West Bank. My parents set it up so that way I would stay with my uncles there. And I had a taxi driver bring me to the border between Jordan and uh, I guess it would be Jordan and Israel border. I can't remember what the name of that border is, but um, went in. And the second I got there, it was actually it was a lot uh, it was a lot different than what I expected. I I understood that. It was, you know, militarized, militarized beforehand. I didn't understand how bad it was. And I don't think my mother actually understood how bad it was either. So obviously going through the border, that, that was the whole thing in of itself. The second they, they saw my name was the Muslim name. Uh, I got interrogated and, and everything. But once I actually got there to my uh, uncle's house in Budin, it was uh, within the first hour, literally within the first hour, I go to my uncle's house, we're having tea. He brings me up to his rooftop just to sit down. They have some chairs in the rooftop. And all of a sudden, we start seeing uh, these, these young men run down from the mountaintops. And they start running down from the mountaintops and they start setting all of the mountainside on fire. Uh, and this is, the, this is the mountainside where all of our olive trees are. Uh, and I was stunned. I had no idea what was happening. And my family was, they were shocked too, but it was definitely, they've definitely seen this a lot before. So I was shocked, like what's going on, freaking out. And they're like, oh, those are the most softening. That's the Arabic word for settlers. Um, and I started seeing the house closest to the mountainside start throwing rocks at them back. It was just the settlers and uh, the settlers and some of the people in my village. And they continue, they continue to try, they continue to just light our entire mountainside on fire. And eventually the IDF came and 
I thought that they were going to help because, you know, I would assume that you could call the, I was like, okay, well, why I just actually asked my uncle, I was like, why don't we just call the police and like do something? He's like, what police? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, that really, that situation, I have some videos of it I could play too, but uh, that of course, situation, yeah. uh, you want me to go ahead and play that now or? Yeah, I what what time of day was this? This was right. This was I arrived. I think around like it was. I mean, it was during the daytime, so I think around like one or two p.m. Actually. Yeah, and this is what Americans need to uh, grapple with: is that there's no nine one one that Palestinians can call on the West Bank. Oh. It, it's if I, I I try to get people to put themselves in this scenario where, okay, imagine your home is right next to gang territory. And there's a violent gang, extremist fanatical gang, right across the street, and they're armed with the most, the latest mil spec M4s with plenty of ammo. And they can just come anytime they want and do whatever they want, including kill you, you know, uh, rape your family. And you can't just pick up 911. And you can't protect yourself. There's no Second Amendment for Palestinians. You know, here in the United States, you can have a gun in your house to protect yourself. Palestinians, the West Bank, don't have that option. And they don't have the option to just call 911. So what do they do? What, what, what possible means can they use to protect themselves in that scenario? I, I would be horrified. Like, I, so I, I just want, I'm trying to get Americans to try to, try to imagine their family in that situation and what they would do, you know? So, no. yeah, let's, uh, with that being said, let's, let's play that video. Yeah. So here, give me just a second to pull it up. So, this, so it's this one right here, right? Yep. That's, so that's the one I took on my phone and that's when they just started lighting the mountainside. Um, and then I think this one's a sh the shorter video actually. Oh yeah. And then let me pull up the whole video when I actually zoomed in. So when they started lighting the mountainside, it got, the fires, it got a lot larger and I'm about to show you in a sec. And when it did, that's when the IDF came. And it's important to realize that, especially it's, it's very hard nowadays to differentiate between the IDF and the settlers because they're one and the mm -hmm. same. A lot of the times what we see is that the settlers will just toss on their IDF uniform and then come down. Mm -hmm. And then they'll just say, oh, we're the IDF. We can do whatever we want. So that's, that's what people mm -hmm. have to realize. Um, so at this point, that's when the... IDF came, of course, they just bring up the flag. Um, and it's that house that's closest to them with the young men that were basically trying to protect their house. And uh, it kept the fire just kept growing. So the the thing here is that they will intentionally target the houses closest to them one at a time and right. we own that entire like when i say we because the villa like a uh, quarter of the village has the same last name as me so right. um my you know it's, we go far back and uh so somebody in my village one of our pe people own that mountainside now we can't touch that mountainside whatsoever because what will happen is that these fires happen They'll burn all of our olive trees, the settlers will. And then the IDF will come and say, this land is going to be blocked off for safety. And they'll yeah. just block off the whole mountainside. It doesn't matter if you make your living off of those olive harvests, you just can't touch them. They'll do that and they'll keep it blocked off for a couple of years. And then one day they'll decide to just call it state land. And once yeah. they call it state land, you wait a couple of years after that and all of a sudden these settlers start to build their outposts. Um, so what they're trying to do here is, and so many times after this, this house has been taking the blunt of the targeting because it's the one closest to their settlement, which is on the top of that hilltop. So every year they're basically trying to enroach closer and closer down. And there were so many Palestinian houses on this mountainside closer to the top, but settlers, uh, in the West bank, what they'll do is all the Palestinian villages now are in the valleys. And all the settlements are on the mountaintops and they kind of keep us pushed down and then they put checkpoints leaving the valleys. Um, and then 
Oh, I didn't mention. So the settlement that that's right next to my family's house, uh, my, right next to my family's village, this is called the, the, the Yitzar settlement, is known as the most aggressive, hostile settlement in the entire West Bank. Um, so the rabbis of, of Yitzar actually preach the slaughter of, of Gentiles, not just Palestinians, but anybody. Um, so they're very, these are very ultra right wing extremist settlers. Um, yeah, the first, the first video um, I saw you in, one of your first videos you put out on social media that I saw was about this uh, settlement. Um, yeah. So it had an immediate, um, it grabbed my attention immediately. And um, yeah. it's 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 tough. And what what they'll do is that the, the so the IDF will do a few things. One, they'll either just try to make some sort of peace and then tell the settlers, "Hey, you have to leave," and uh, which doesn't happen that often. Two, they'll basically just stand there and pretend they don't see what the settlers are doing and let yeah. them keep doing it. Or three, they'll actually enable them to do it. So in this case, and you have to realize these settlers came and started lighting up the mountainside on their own. We had nothing to do with it. Um, but after they did that, the, oh, let me remove because I was going to show up another video. After they did that, instead of the IDF actually helping, what they do is they come down with the settlers and they started storming through the village. I, I think this might be the right video. So that's my uncle actually on the rooftop with me. Um, and what you'll have to realize, some of these were just settlers a bit ago. So they literally just grabbed, so the IDF came, they gave them their guns, they gave the settlers right. their guns, and they put on jackets, and they just started coming through. So what they'll do to scare Palestinians is once they raid a village, they'll try to find a young guy, like a young man, and they'll, they'll kidnap him. They'll just take him for the day. Sometimes they'll either like put him in prison for a few years, or they'll beat him bloody. So this time, it was actually the house right next to us, so my uncle's neighbor. They uh, kidnapped the boy, uh, and they they beat the hell out of him. So while that was happening, all me and my uncles heard was screaming. We had no idea what was going on. We knew the screaming was coming from his neighbor's house, and his neighbors actually took a video. Um, and it and it's it's the video that I, I just sent is basically the IDF now yelling at the mother, "Where's the boy? Where's the boy? Give us the boy." And they're talking about her son, um, and that's and that's what that video is of the of the IDF member just screaming. And they they did end up taking her son, and they they found him the next day. They tossed him on the side of the road, and he was brought to the hospital, and he was just completely bloody. I on Palestine actually posted that that video of the confrontation um, a few years back on their page. How old was the boy? He was uh like what was he? I think he was I believe he was nine. Believe he's nine. Jesus Christ. Um, so it's a fear. It's a it's like a fear. Ta it's a fear tactic. Yeah. So and yeah, they're basically making yeah, their it's... statement like this is you know this is our land. We'll do what you we'll do whatever we want. And this is where you were talking about what can the Palestinians do? You can't call the police. Well, they're basically telling you you better not do anything. You just kind of have to take it. Yeah. And that's yeah, just take it. You just have to take it, and that's where, um, if you're a young man and you're seeing, and you have to remember, I mean, people in the West Bank they're very traditional. The, the men are getting married what, in their twenty early twenties, you know. Mm -hmm. So you're you're imagine you're a young guy in your twenties, and you see these settlers just destroying your olive harvest when you're married and you have a young kid and you're 22 years old, for example. And these settlers just come and they start destroying your olive trees and you know that you're not going to make any money if you don't harvest your own land. You're going to want to fight back and protect your family and protect your land. And what happens when you do? Well, you're, you're either going to get killed or you're just going to get tossed in prison, yeah. which basically every single young, every single man in my family that's in the West Bank has been in prison for some time. It's not, that's not an exception. That's just the norm. Uh, you're, yeah. you know, so that's, that's kind of their life, which is, it's just tragic. And that's really what kickstarted my activism, trying to figure out a way to just stop this. And that's what I admire about you too, is that you're, like I said, I, I think that people like you are Israel's worst nightmare. <laughs> you're, you're, because you're American and Palestinian which is a formidable combination because you have all the tools 
uh, and freedoms of being American and the platform. And you will never forget, you know, you it's in your bones. You, you will not turn against your people. You won't turn away from your people. Um, so th they are, I think a lot of the censorship, the very aggressive attempts at censorship are designed to keep people like you out of the fight as much as possible because of the fact that, you know, you're a very charismatic guy. Um, you're as American as apple pie, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, so, but you, you're, uh, you're definitely going to stand up for your people. They don't want that. They fear that they fear it far more than, um, any, any type of, I guess, international resolution, you know, more than anything, because the charisma that American Palestinians have is the, is a threat to this bubble that they're trying to keep around average Americans yep. who don't know what's going on. So people like you pierce the bubble oftentimes, and especially the younger generation, but the cat's out of the bag in so many ways. And I, I just feel that the more efforts they try to do into silencing people like you and keeping people like you, um, out of the conversation, it's only going to backfire, you know? So, um, I, I, I hope that this, this particular episode gets a lot of view, view viewers because th they, uh, those in the audience who are, uh, strictly in the American bubble and don't know enough about, uh, about the reality of the West bank. We see what's happening in Gaza, obviously. Uh, but a lot of people, the West bank is kind of an enigma. We hear stories like what you're saying, but we don't really have an American telling those stories uh, who were on the ground as it happened. It's it's oftentimes secondhand from Palestinians who are there and they told somebody and they weren't were were not lucky enough to get some video footage of it, you know, but you experienced this firsthand on your what you said it was your first uh, hour there. Yeah, my first hour. It's, it's, it's just how commonplace it's insane. It is. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it's uh, and what I what I always try to tell Americans to try to to try to grasp this better is that you know imagine I don't know who's America's worst enemy right now like China or Russia for example they they came in and for somehow Chinese Chinese or Russians were able to just steal you know like twenty square miles worth of land in Texas uh, this is a funny analogy but imagine what the the Texans would do to try to stop that from happening. And then when they try to fight back, they're labeled as terrorists. They're terrorists. Uh, it's yeah. just, it, that, that's what really just irks me. Uh, and it sucks because I've never, there's, I've never experienced, and I was just there visiting and then imagining the lack of freedom that they have. I think that's what, that, that's what breaks my heart more than anything that these settlers can just come down and kill uh, an 11 year old boy and just shoot him in the head, which just happened a few weeks ago in my family's village. And instead of having, you know, being reprimanded or being sentenced in prison, they'll just post photos of it because the settlements have their own Facebook groups. It's like snuff group chats and they'll just post photos of these mm -hmm. dead young Palestinians and laugh. And I think that sort of injustice, like, I feel like if you, if you just have a heart that has to bother you to some degree. Uh, I think Israeli propaganda in the United States has done a good job as as framing us as all, you know, just Arab terrorists. Um, so that narrative is starting. To I think that narrative. Up. It is. I think that narrative is starting to disintegrate. You know, uh, I think the pro pali movement has poured acid on it, on that narrative, and it's slowly just dissolving. The word terrorist, it has no it's losing its punch. Yeah, just just like the, th throwing the uh, accusation of anti-Semitism, that's losing its punch too. Absolutely, you know, because it, you can you can only cry wolf so many times before it's tasteless. The salt has no taste anymore, and uh, even and I I've noticed the effects of the propaganda on myself. You know, like I I could tell you for sure that my opinion of Hamas has definitely changed since October seventh. Yeah, I didn't know a lot about Hamas other than just your typical headlines, your typical bullet points that's often talked about. Um, but 
the more I look at it, I'm like, okay, Hamas is a terrorist group c compared to what? Yeah. Compared to the Boy Scouts, okay. Compared to the Boy Scouts, well, no, actually, no. With their with their um, with their molestation scandal, never mind. Bad and out, bad comparison. But <laughs> I mean, you 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 look at you know forty thousand plus murdered in Gaza, a genocide going on. Um, everything that the United States government has done throughout the world, w w compared to what? Yeah, you know, I'm not saying that Hamas doesn't kill innocent people or they'd use tactics of terror, but if we're going to call them terrorists, then you have to call everybody else a terrorist. You got to call the U.S. government, the State Department, the Pentagon, you know, the IDF. You got to call Britain a terrorist government, a, a, a state terror actor. You know, you have to you have to go all across the board. So I said, OK, you're going to call Hamas a terrorist group. Let's call everybody a terrorist group then. Everybody who's ever used violent means against any group of people, you have to call them terrorists. As far as I'm concerned, like compared to the United States, like I I'm slowly starting to see Hamas as like the National Guard of Gaza at this point. Yeah. Right. right? It, like using your analogy. No, and and, it's, and and that's the thing is pretty insane actually. For speaking on that, Yitzhar, the settlement because they're known as the most violent. These guys are so violent they'll actually attack the IDF sometimes because they don't think the IDF is being hostile enough, which is just insane to me. Yeah. But then if you read the yeah. Times of Israel or the Jerusalem Post, they call these people ultra right, uh, far right activists, far right settler activists. <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah. these, these settler activists are their, their rabbis preach for the, the killing of, of Christians and Muslims and anybody who basically isn't a Zionist, uh, but they're not terrorists. They're mm -hmm. just they're just, you know, nice religious activists. Um, I, I think yeah. realizing they're, that, they're, they're, they're a little on the extreme side, you know, a little on the extreme side, but nothing, nothing too we'll crazy. Let it pass. It's just that's see, so I didn't really start. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it wasn't until the past few months that I started paying attention to the, the words that are used in the media headlines, too. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I've been speaking out about Palestine and ever since my trip, that's really what changed me. But I've become very interested in on my social media. I've been talking about it a lot is the history of the U.S. and Israel together and also seeing Israel's influence in the media and noticing all of that. That didn't happen, honestly, until October 7th. Uh, and that's really, honestly, just reframed my views, not just on the U.S.-Israel relationship, but just uh, on, on an international level, just the way I see the world has shifted because of that. When I realize uh, how much the, the media's Same. influence and everything else. Yeah. Same. I mean, as as much as my perspective had had already changed uh, in my time over there at, at the age of 18 and 19 years old, even still, there's tons of residual um, propaganda brainwashing that's still back back here. You know, yeah. it's just a part of human nature when you're when you're uh, uh, shoved propaganda, you know, your whole life, you still have those remnants of that. But that's I, I'm, I'm very grateful for, you know, people like you making content to constantly like how I feel, how I see people like you and the content you make, it's deprogramming, right? It's, it's, it's it, because we have to, for, for this much propaganda that's been pressed into, uh, into your average person, average American, you need this much more deprogramming yeah. to happen. Right. Absolutely. And so the past six months, it's, like I I've, I've been slowly just going in the different corners of my brain that still have that residual kind of um uh the the, resi the residual stigmas around certain things yeah. that has been removed you know like who would have thought that that Hamas would be seen as not a terrorist organization but we're slowly seeing the world shift their narrative um and seeing Hamas in the light of self defense right yeah it's it's insane and i'm so i'm actually i'm really curious because you were you mentioned that this experience has brought you closer closer to your religious uh to, to christianity and i have friends and i've always asked this to christians that aren't american because i so i asked my brazilian friend actually a few weeks ago i was like what are because he grew up in a very religious uh christian house and I, I was like what are your views on israel and i think what was really interesting is talking to christian uh, christians that aren't american and seeing what their views are on Israel and comparing it to American Christian views on Israel. 
because what I've realized is it's uh, a lot of it isn't even about the religion. But I mean, Israel has been, you know, pushing propaganda on Christian religious groups since since Israel was born. Uh, and seeing mm-hmm. how that influenced the propaganda and how American Christians view Israel and how they have a closer affini- affinity to it religiously than other Christians elsewhere, that's been really interesting too. And it all just goes back to the media and the propaganda. Uh, and it takes a long time to, you know, to unravel that. Uh, I, I'm curious though, do you feel like your advocacy, like for other Christians that are very religious, had, uh, that say, you know, we have to stand with Israel because that's what the Bible tells us. How, how did you kind of figure that out for yourself or come to deal deal with that? Like, how did you kind of come to peace with that and figure out what that means for you? Well, um, to be quite honest with you, I, I've cut myself off from the American Christian world a long time ago. Uh, I would say, shit, maybe 10 years now, you know, like... Yeah. And this sounds very harsh to say, but I will not step for I will not step foot in an American church ever again. It's a personal preference of mine. Now, mind you, I my dad was a pastor. Oh. You know, I, I was the chap I was the chaplain's kid. You know, um, now my dad was not a, a a Zionist, hardcore Zionist. In fact, as a young kid, I was pro- I was brainwashed by the churches we would go to. So I grew up. As an army brat, we traveled to different states. I grew up. I probably, yeah, I went to, uh, I went to five schools uh, growing up. Uh, I lived in five different states, uh, two different countries. Yeah. But I, so whenever we would move, we would have to find a local church. And I, I think it was Kansas, uh, Kansas City. When we moved to Kansas City, we went. We my my parents were trying to find a, a local church to go to. And we found one. It was a big mega church. And uh, that's that was when I'm like 12, 12 years old. So we spent uh, about, you know, four to five years in Kansas City. So we're talking about like 12 years old up into age 16. That that prime, you know, um, age range is when I was obviously, you know, in junior high school and stuff. And, you know, I've always grew up religious. So going to this mega church they were super, you know, pro Israel and evangelical. Yeah. And that's when all the indoctrination really started to set in because at the moment, at the time I was, I was very much into like, um, uh, po- uh apocalyptic, uh, literature okay. and, you know, the book of revelations, book of Daniel. So in, in these evangelical communities, there's a fetish around the apocalypse and about revelations. Yeah. They have entire nights. Um, they ha- Wednesday nights is usually the night where, uh, evangelicals will go to church and they'll have a whole uh, whole session on uh, ch- interpreting the book of Revelations and what w- interpreting the times we're in. And Israel would always be at the center, of course. And the way that evangelical churches would um, talk about Israel, they're talking about Israel as if Israel today is the Israel of the Bible in the past. Yeah, the biblical Israel. The ancient Israelites. Yeah. Right. So they're making, they're, they're making that conflation. And to the untrained eye, to someone who's never somebody who's never been over there or done any research into the Palestinians and what's been done to the Palestinians, you don't know any better because all you all you see is, oh, ancient, oh, the Jews have come back. They've come back to the Holy Land. Fulfillment of prophecy. Check. Yeah. Okay, what's going on in Israel? Well, her enemies are all are all around her and they're trying to destroy her. Oh, just like the Bible says it would happen. Yeah. So you make these connections and to the untrained eye to the um to the to the person who hasn't you know learned about history or learned about uh international affairs it all makes sense right yeah so that's that was my that was and that's what got me really fanatical it wasn't my parents it was this church that we went to and my dad my i mean i was way more you know pro-israel than my parents or anybody in my family they were just kind of like okay mark uh, your obsession with israel is a little weird but okay interesting yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, they, you know, they were pro-Israel, I would say, but not like here you were at. not like yeah, exactly. So I'm the one that said, "Dad, I want to, Mom, Dad, I want to go to, I want to go to Israel to study." And they said, "All right, son, go ahead," because I, my, my siblings, they all went to straight to college okay. after high school. I said, "No, I don't want to go." I was, in fact, I was 
scheduled to go to Oral Roberts University. I don't know if you know what that is. No. It's the it's okay. It's the crown jewel of evangelical universities okay. in the evangelical world. Yeah. And my you know my my mom went there. My my sister went there. My brother went there. My dad went there. And so you know it was time for me to go there. But I said no. I'm going to Hebrew University to study. Right. And I'm gonna I'm gonna and I was even I even had plans to join the IDF. True story. I was gonna join the IDF. Oh, yeah. Damn. Because mind you now. It, so, it sounds weird, right? But you have to understand the reason why is because I'm thinking that the Israel I'm going to is the is the righteous Israel of the Bible. And you have to save it and right? protect it and stand with it. And that, that, right. Yeah. All that. Yeah. All that good shit. So I'm like, okay. So I go off at, right after high school, like that summer, boom, I'm on a plane. I'm so excited. And I immediately, of course, fall in love with the uh, the land itself. Yeah. You know, like I fell in, I fell in love with Jerusalem. My first day there, just seeing that you know the 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 dome of the rock in the distance, and you know entering that that kind of like that that narrow um, canyon yeah. as you as you go from Tel Aviv. And so I was immediately in love with Jerusalem for sure. Now, again, my first day there, they we we arrive at the campus. The bus takes us to the campus. They give us, um, we go to the, uh, the student office for foreigners, for foreign students, and they write on a piece of paper, your, they assign you your dorm and your room number, right? So I'm like, all right, sweet. So this was the Resnick Dormitory, named after, in honor of Resnick, that you know what I'm talking about? He was, uh, Resnick was, he, he was involved in, in the genocide of Palestinians back in the day. Oh, right. So they named a whole dormitory in honor of him. So they assign me my dorm. I, and I get there. It's my first night in Jerusalem, mind you. I get there, and guess what? Everybody on my dorm floor are Palestinian Muslims. Oh. And, you know, now, mind you, at the time, um, I, I had been filled with a lot of is Islamophobia yeah. from church. But I, I had no problem with Arabs or Palestinians as far as, like, a racial thing, you know. Uh, I, of course, I was taught that they're the enemies of Israel, but... Me, I was I was a guy who just loved to talk to people. I didn't care if we disagreed politically. So I hear these Palestinians, uh, you know, talking loud in Arabic. Their, their, their doors open and they're eating hummus and smoking hookah. <laughs> and I walk in and I always tell the story. I said the first thing I said. And by the way, the, these guys that I'm about to meet, they wind up becoming my best friends for life, my closest friends in my life. And the first thing I said to him is like, what's up, you terrorist motherfuckers? <laughs> That's the first thing I said to him. And, <laughs> and I, I constantly tell. Now, you have to understand, imagine what their expression was. White boy from America walks in and just said, what's up, you terrorist motherfuckers? Now, if that were, if I was, if I was them, I would have beat the shit out of me. Yeah, where did right all right that confidence there. come from? That's what I'm curious. <laughs> ah, dude, I was just, well... I, mean, I was, dude, I was, okay, you have to understand, I am one of the world's biggest dumbasses, okay? I, 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 I will, I am not, I am not ashamed to say that I am as dumb as you can fucking get. And at the time I was even dumber, if you can imagine that. So I was dumb and I was excited and I was, I was young and, and, you know, uh, horny as shit, of course, you know, cause I'm, I'm trying to like find my, my next Israeli girlfriend and I, uh, I walk in. And I, and I say that to them and, and I tell the story is like a third of them wanted to kick my ass. Of course, uh, another third was laughing their ass off and the other third, um, they wanted to kick my ass, but they also thought it was kind of funny. And they were actually kind of curious, like, who is this white American motherfucker that just walks in and says that shit. And, and, but see, here's the thing about Palestinians that people don't understand. Palestinians, they have a, they have a, an amazing sense of humor. And they're very, very patient with ignorance. And they, they're they not the ostracizing type. Like, they, 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 there's this cushion that Palestinians give every human being, even if they disagree with that human being. They're more than happy to get to know somebody, even no matter how ignorant that person is, just, to, just as, a, as, a, as a standard protocol procedure of being a human being. It's in their culture. It's, in, it's part of their hospitality. So, of course, they're offering me hookah. Of course, they're offering me um, hummus. So I'm sitting down. We're arguing, of course, arguing politics. But you know what? I love these guys. Yeah. Like there was something about them that was like I, I was I felt like I was able to be myself no matter how stupid I was. I really felt 
like there was like this brotherly bond that was forming within this first hour and i'm like dude these guys are fucking awesome like i like i i really like the vibes here you know yeah. and then i start of course spewing all the propaganda out and they are just swatting the propaganda out of the sky with their fly swatter you know like yeah. they are knocking down every single form of ignorance i'm throwing at them um and I, I was telling them, like, for example, this is what I learned in church, is that uh, uh, you guys, I heard that Islam means submission, right? And they said, and then one of my friends says, his, by the way, his, his name was, and he was, uh, he wound up becoming my best friend. He goes, he goes, uh, yeah, to God, you dumb shit. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right, all right, I didn't know, I didn't know, man. So like. And they, and it was a lot. I can't tell you how many years of deprogramming happened in that one hour. Oh, really? Like and then you before you know it, like you, you reconsider things from that first hangout with them. Just that one hour. Now, of course, there's a lot more deprogramming yeah, to go left, right? Yeah. But just that one hour, I'm talking like a whole stack of books worth of propaganda just burned up. Have you ever in met my a house right? before that? Like, probably not. I would assume before you went to Israel. No. Yeah. No. Nah. Not at all, actually. In fact, I come to, I don't try to think. I, I don't think there was before that moment. So I wind up really liking these guys. They wind up really liking me. And then I wind up going to their villages. I wind up traveling all throughout that whole territory. The only place I did not go was the Negev fully yeah. or Gaza, obviously. But I, I've, I've, I can honestly say that I've traveled to more of Israel than most Israelis have. I know more of Israel than Israelis, I, and I can honestly say that because it's a, it's a it's, it is a statistical fact. Yeah. And you know, I, I would go, you know, I would go to Fardus, you know, Amufaham, Anablus, all those places, and I would stay with their families, um, meet, meet their families, meet their meet their sisters and brothers and grandparents. And I'm just telling you, it was the most amazing experience I could, I could say to this day. And I've been around the world and, and, but I can tell you there was, and, and I try to tell Americans, this is that you just don't understand that when, when you're on good terms with Palestinians, if you know one Palestinian, you know, all of them, like, yeah. it, it's just a fact. Like I could go to any village, you know, in, in Palestine and I will never be homeless or hungry. Because I could literally just go up to a random Palestinian and say, hey, do you know uh, so-and-so? I'm his friend. Can you, uh, do you know where he's at? And he'd be like, yeah, yeah, hold on, hold on. He'll make a phone call. Who will make a phone call to a cousin who will make a yeah. phone call? Be like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know him. Hey, come to my house. Uh, you'll have, um, have, some, have some dinner before you go. If you want to stay with us, you want to stay with us. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just be like... Oh, yeah, and they'll get mad Palestinian if you don't stay yeah. with them and they don't give you dinner. They'll get mad. Oh. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I and, and so like I don't know of any place on this planet that's like that. Like I, where can you go on this planet where you can just walk into a village, and just talk to a random person and expect to be fed and expect a place to stay that night? That's how warm it is in these Palestinian villages. Americans will never understand that experience until you go there, you know. Yeah. And and like I said, when I experienced that culture of Palestinians, it was starting to all kind of make sense where I really started to connect the dots. I'm like, wait a minute, the way these guys are behaving and the way this culture is, it's very similar to the Bible. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, the books are so similar. So much of the beliefs are the same. They're acting like Jesus. What the <laughs> hell is going on? And that's where I was really starting to like, wait a minute, hold on a second. And that's, and, and, and that's when I tell people that my walk with Jesus was my walk with the Palestinians mm. because I saw Jesus in how they lived. Mm. And that's when it really connected and, and dawned on me. And this is where it gets into kind of like my controversial um, opinion as I did more research into it later on was that I, I, I again, I, I don't believe that um, ancient um ancient religious scripture should ever be used to justify any type of um, ethnocracy or theocracy of any kind. However, I will say that from a biblical perspective, if I were to go there, just like the Zionists always go there, they always use the Bible to justify it. I'm like, okay, 
let's let's use the Bible for a second. Let's let's use the Bible to justify some shit for a second. All right. And in doing my research, I, I realized that the Palestinians are more Israelite than most of the Europeans that immigrated there. Right. Yeah. They did genetic studies and like they the Palestinians for left to be very reductive. They are the ancient Israelites. The ancient Israelites, meaning the one when when the when the Israelites or the Jews were kicked out of that area by the Romans, the ones that stayed behind eventually became the Palestinians. Yeah, and that's that's as Israelite as you. Yeah, get. that's exactly what I explain to people because what uh, what the, the propaganda that you'll hear is that oh they're all just Arabs and they invaded during the seventh century and before that there were no Arabs living in that land. And I keep trying to tell people, Palestinians are Jews that converted to Islam during the seventh century. We've yep. always been there. Yep. And I actually did my own genetic studies. It's surprisingly closest, people closest to me genetically are Iraqi Jews, Sephardic Jews, Mitzvah, like all, basically every single Arab Jew. And, they, and, the, and that's yeah. another thing actually, because before Israel was born, like, you know, this, this brand new country, uh, there were Jews all across the Middle East. And every all across the Middle East, and they they weren't they they were called Arab Jews. They spoke Arabic. They were they they were Arabs, yep. and they were just Jews. And there was no difference. That was whether there was Iraqi Jews, there were you know Yemeni Jews, and even in in Palestine, there there were just Jews. And and it was the relationships were great because I was actually talking to my my mom about this actually right before we got on this uh, this podcast. And, and she was telling me about it. And she was like, we had no issues. It wasn't until the, the Yehuniya came, the Zionists came uh, from Europe. And that's when everything changed. Now, if you go to Israel, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Mitzrahi Jews, they don't, most of them don't speak Arabic anymore uh, because, you know, they're yeah. all in Israel. They're all together. They have no reason to. But it's, uh, that's, that, that's also been really, it's, it's, it's interesting seeing how things have changed. Plus they all, they look so similar to us too. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, yeah, you know, you can't tell the difference and then they make fun of the way we look and you look at these Mitzrahi Jews who are Arab Jews and they look exact. I can't tell the difference. She's like, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and what's funny is the racism that was thrown at them before they were assimilated into Israeli culture they were treated like third class citizens. They were treated like, you know, they were the they were the brown skin Jews that you used for the labor. Yeah. You know? That was that was how they were treated. Now that's changed obviously because Israel has gotten so desperate for support that they're now all of a sudden kind of like being less racist towards their own brown uh Mizrahi Jews mm -hmm. because they're so desperate to keep that uh narrative that they're they're just um they're just uh, um, universally pro-Jewish, which they're not. Yeah. But they're 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 you know. But yeah, I, I, it, it's that that study that I did, like that research, that deep dive. And by the way, I took a deep dive into that whole genetic background of Palestinians because of an of an inkling in the back of my head, like this suspicion that I had because when I was in these Palestinian villages and just seeing the way that they lived and how, I don't know how to put it. I, I really, there's really a hard, there's very few words to describe the vibes that you get from being in a Palestinian village. It's, it's sacred, I guess, reverent, um, holy. I don't know. Uh, ancient. I don't know how, I don't know a word to really describe the vibe that I get from it. But to me, it, it, it was a suspicion. I'm like, wait a minute. These guys are, I just have a feeling that these are the ancient Israelites and these, these white Europeans are just kind of like, you know, um, they're, they're, they're posing, you know? <laughs> so I like, so I'm just, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to look more into this. I'm going to see if my suspicion is correct. And then upon my research, I'm like, Ooh, and I'm, and I found it. I found the, uh, I found, you know, like the, the genetic studies that were done. I'm like, that's it. The, and, and it's, and it's interesting because, the the way that the zionists use the torah to justify um them taking over the land the same verses you could the palestinians could use if it were ever if if it ever became well known that the palestinians are actually the true israelites the true ancient israelites it all of it makes sense the persecution of the palestinians you know yeah. and I, I i have you have you ever um seen the zionist map 
their 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 um pipe dream yeah map. i have actually I've been Based talking about the greater israel map is that what you're referring to or yeah yeah, yeah i have I, and, yeah the greater israel every single damn year it gets bigger because uh now and they're talking about it dude they're talking about it public like in the mainstream now uh there's this guy named adrian steen or stein i don't know how to pronounce his last name but he wrote a he wrote a huge op-ed in the times of israel just like last month and uh it was a three series op-ed and it's called from the river to the river from the nile to the euphrates and they're talking this is mm -hmm. like a shit ton of land this is like iraq syria lebanon uh saudi arabia yep. and and they talk about how they sinai. Uh, sinai and they talk about how they want to purify mecca and medina like the most the most religious it's insane it's insane and uh it, it's insane yeah and and people don't realize that it's a it's not it's an expansionist re regime i mean even last week there's now these new groups they started tossing up their logos these zionist groups that are calling for the resettlement of southern lebanon uh, and and yeah. well, they're they're not going to stop and that's what's not that's what worries me the most that i i care about the most because they they won't stop and i don't know how to yeah i keep trying to think back in history i don't even know if like christopher columbus did that like the, the way that they're using religion to justify what they're doing i don't know how you can stop it because how can you stop something that's based in their like that they've intertwined with religion it's very how, how do you deconstruct that for them i have no idea honestly oh yeah it's you you can't it's it's a, it's a it's a fanatic lie. it's the same reason that uh you know that the the biggest comparison i can say to zionism was the manifest destiny mm. you know with the eradication of the native americans the way that the manifest de destiny was that um that 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 document that was revered uh by the pioneers to in their justification for eradicating the native americans mm. it's like well it says in the manifest destiny this is our destiny so that's the the only comparison i can see but follow me on this one for a second yeah. okay so the uh the the greater israel map all right so that map is what 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 conceived that map what they're basing that map on is the prophecies in the torah um of the promise to yaakov that by god saying that i will give your descendants this land and then it lists and then it says in the torah like the different territories right well the irony being is that you know the europeans who came into you know palestine they're you know they're they're the the, the palestinians have have more you know israelite you know ancestry than they do yes. so there that prophecy does even if you're going to use prophecy to justify it because that's where I, I try to get the i try to tell people is okay look if you want to defeat zionism one of the methods that i like to do is okay i'm going to beat them at their own game yeah. right like okay so you're using the bible and the torah to justify what you're doing all right so let's go down that road let's go down that road of the bible all right well the promise to yaakov was in the implication that his descendants would inherit that land right now judaism is a religion israelite is not a religion that's the ancestry that's the genetic lineage yeah. that goes down right so it, it was not saying that people who converted to this religion will inherit this land so this the prophecy people. is that the it's 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 a genetic implication right now that sounds very um that sounds very racist and ethnocentric and, and yeah it is okay i'm not using this at all to i'm not giving this any weight i'm just i'm just playing this i'm i'm hu i'm humoring their logic for a second yeah so okay the ants the the descendants of yaakov are the palestinians so and what's ironic about that whole greater israel map is because of the persecution of palestinians where's where are the um where are the where are the um palestinian epi palestinian refugee epicenters palestinians are in that outline of the greater israel based on that prophecy which i find so ironic yeah. so because of the persecution of the palestinians they have had they have they have had to you know go into exile into these areas mm -hmm. that directly match the prophecy of the ancient israelites
Mm. That's just uh it's it's an irony that's not wasted on me at all that the prophecy of the Torah of where the Israelites will wind up being are the exact same areas that the Palestinians are now refugees in southern Lebanon, Syria, Jordan. Yeah. You know, um and and, and Palestinians they I believe that they have a higher birth rate than any of the groups in that whole in the Middle East, right? Aren't they the fastest growing population as far as the, having the most children? Yeah, right? and compare, uh, I think the only one that beats them is actually ultra Orthodox Jews. <laughs> they have the hot, yeah. right? Which and and, making, and those are dwindling. Like ultra Orthodox Judaism is dying. It's a dying sect, I believe. Uh, right, as far as. As far as religious um, converts, oh, right? Yeah, I mean, they don't like, I don't believe they like converts. What I do know is that actually I was reading a study and they're having like six to seven children per family. It's gone, it gets so bad that the, yeah. that the females can't even, they have a hard time like taking care of the family and everything. But it's, uh, but on your yeah. point, honestly, it's, it's what's, and this is what's been bothering me. Like, this is what really irks me is that they flipped the whole script. So oh, I started hearing this rhetoric that all of a sudden now actually I'm the colonizer and these are Palestinian settlements in Jewish in, in the Jewish land. And they'll say that I yeah. like Palestinians are the invaders and that we just go back to Saudi Arabia where we came from. I have no inkling of Saudi Arabian blood in me. We're like, and they try to and that's another thing. They really try to clump all Arabs up together. Uh, and I always and I always tell people and there is there is a distinction. I mean. Palestinians were Arab, we call ourselves Arab, but there is a difference between peninsular Arabs and being Arabized. So, you know, yeah. Palestinians exactly. were Jew Jews who converted to Islam. They were Arabized, they adopted Arabic, but they've always been there. Uh, but they, they just say, oh no, we all invaded, we're, we're, you know, we're all clumped up, we're actually the invaders, we're the colonizers. And especially over the past few months, seeing the script just flip like that, it's insane, these mental... Uh, these mental tricks they'll do has just been is pretty insane. How do how do people that have the highest it skin is. cancer, or how are they from? I don't know. <laughs> you know, how are they from the land? <laughs> yeah, it, it, so and it's not it's not time. like, <laughs> and it's not like we're saying that just because you have white skin, like this isn't like an anti-white thing. It's just that you're if you're gonna use the if you're gonna use um biblical justification for what you're doing which is insane in and of itself because it goes against what the bible says as well it's contradictory to it but if you're going to do that then even at that game you lose because when the the prophecies in the torah that talk about the inheritance of the children of yaakov it was not referring to a religion it was not referring to people who converted to judaism judaism wasn't even officially this wasn't even a religion at that time it was just believing in the Torah, right? right? But it was specifically referring to the, the the genetic descendants of Yaakov, you know, who was renamed Israel, obviously. But that, so the, the Palestinians are in essence, and I'm not saying that they're literally fulfilling the prophecy in the sense that like, like whether or not I believe in this prophecy or not is irregardless. I'm not trying to, you know, shove religion down the, the audience's throat. But what I am saying is if you were to take that route, of using prophecy to explain what's happening, then the Palestinians fulfill that prophecy. They inherited that land. Mm. They never left. They've always been there. Even after the Romans kicked most of them out, they the ones that stayed behind to tend to the olive groves for the Roman Empire to supply the Roman Empire with olive oil, that's the Palestinians today. Yeah. So it, it, so I mean it's the irony to me is just it, I, I forgot that one historian. He said. He said that. He said it best. He said the irony is infuriating. It is. You know. It is. It, and I. And it was kind of cool. I'm not. I was never really into. Uh, gene I don't like genetics to prove. I, I don't like to prove something. But it's. It has been really interesting looking because I, I looked at my genetic studies and it's funny you said Romans because if you look at uh pal like m most Palestinians that I've actually had them do this too, we have like a very 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 small amount of roman ancestry a lot of palestinians do which makes, which makes sense. sense and it in your dna basically paints history because you're like oh you know this comes from when these people invaded here and it like all points back uh for so long back and um it, it's, it's interesting your palestinian dna kind of like it literally paints a story of of history 
And I think that in and of itself is very mm -hmm. confirming, but you know, fine. it is. And I, I, I love genetics. I love ancestry studies. And so, the, so it's, it, that was, like I said, I, I went to Israel under the notion that the Israelis are the ancient Israelites and I left realizing that the Palestinians are the ancient Israelites. That was the huge change for me. And, and of course, like just obviously the basic humanity of it, regardless, taking, taking the Bible completely out of it, taking religion completely out of it, just the way I saw, um, I mean, getting back to the West bank, for example, how the West bank changed you. Yeah. I mean, how, how, how different are you now that you've been to the West bank? compared to what, who you were before you went I mean it oh, like complete 180 I mean now so much of the work yeah. that I do is related to this even even the friends that I you know that I hang out with just my my what I what I value in life is different and what I want to work towards now you know just trying to fix on justice is uh, injustice is such a big part of my my desire to live honestly and that really that's what really affected me I hate knowing that my uncle and my cousins live there and I've, my relationship with them has gotten so close. And I, and I, I, so I don't ever ask them how they're doing. Never. I will never start a conversation. Cause you know, so it's so like, if I called you up right now and be like, Oh, Hey, how are you? It's, it's almost like it's kind of second nature to just say it and you don't really expect any, you know, but I, I can't do yeah. that because it's never, uh, my cousins actually told me to stop saying that it's it's they find it a, a rude because what are they going to say oh well the settlers came and they blew up our cars this time it's you know it's always bad yeah. news and knowing that i'm so privileged here in florida and i'm i'm living my best life and right across my family can't there's they have no police they can't do anything they're basically prisoners and then if they want to try to resist or fight back they're they're called terrorists and th that's insane and then knowing that this country America is allowing that to happen. That's what really bothers me because I, and it's, I love America. I'm going to be honest. I know that America is causing so many horrible things. I think that the country in of itself, like the naked country, not the, the, the way the politics are run are one thing, but I think that the, the country and the, and the freedom is amazing. And I, because I have this much privilege, I want to use it to make a difference for them. Uh, yeah. But it's, yeah, it just it's so it's so uh, it makes you so angry, you know. Well, that's what makes that's what makes you a hero in my eyes is 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 how this this conscious decision that you've made, which you can see it in your face. Um, a young man like you has the whole world in front of him has decided to take on this cause and, and make it the forefront forefront of his life. You don't have to do that. You're in America. You can do whatever the fuck you want. You can go pursue your own interest and just leave your people behind, but you won't do that because you're a Palestinian. Right. And that to me is what makes a Palestinian a Palestinian. Like they're simply loyal as shit. Like that, like when I, when I tell you that the Palestinians, I, I constantly tell people this, I tell Christians this, I tell anybody this that I can tell. I said, the, the reason I am who I am is because of the Palestinians. They set my moral compass they tweaked it and set it for me like i learned loyalty from the palestinians right i learned reverence to god from the palestinians i learned humility from the palestinians because at age 18 being away from my family completely away from my family for the first time i'm no longer under mommy and daddy's roof i'm in a foreign country i don't speak the language i'm learning the language i uh, so obviously at age 18, like I'm, I'm a, I'm a vulnerable, emotional child who doesn't know the ways of the world. And thank God I was thrown uh, thank God that my first experience in that situation was with the Palestinians because it was like, I was like a piece of clay, you know, like at age 18, yeah. we're like pieces of clay, yeah, right? We're like, we're like, you know, one. yeah. So, and that's, and the Palestinians were there to, to help me and and so i i i uh i learned loyalty from them because i, I the, the, the palestinians w when they're friends with somebody when they're when you're when they're really friends with somebody they will die for them they and that, that i'm not i'm not being hyperbolic they will literally die for you if they're your friends that had a huge imprint on me 
to have friends that were actually willing to, I mean, we use that term, you know, um, metaphorically, like oh, I'll die for you, bro. We, it's Americans don't mean it when we say it to our friends, but Palestinians, when they say that they fucking mean it. So I, I, I you can't buy that with money. You can't pay for that. You can't, there, there's no amount of um, economic incentive you could ever do to make a human being behave like that and take that as part of their actual, you know, uh, personality, but that's how the Palestinians are. So that had an imprint on me and I carried that with me throughout my entire lifetime up into now in my late thirties, you know? And so when October 7th popped off and all this started happening and all the, yeah, all the controversy started and the arguments and debates started, I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta tell people, I mean, because I had my head dug in the sand for the past, you know, whatever, since then, because I'm, you know, we're in our own American bubble. We get selfish, Absolutely. you know, I'm in, I'm in California, I'm in California, living the California life. I, I'm, I'm detached from that past in the sense that I'm not around it anymore. I miss it like hell. I, I would go, I would go there every fucking day if I could, if I had the money and, and ability to go travel there back and forth. But I, I just, that's not how life worked out. But I, I, this whole thing that's happened in the past, you know, six months has reminded me of who I am and, 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 and my, um, my need to tell people about why, what it, what Palestinians mean to me. And it's not because I'm a good person. I tell people this, I'm not an activist. I'm not doing this because I'm a good guy. You know, I'm not a good guy, but I, I'm just being honest with you. I'm, I'm being honest with people about who the Palestinians are from firsthand experience, you know, and I can't lie about that. And mind you, I, my sons, uh, my, my, my wife is of uh, Jewish ancestry. So therefore my son is of Jewish ancestry. Therefore I'm raising him, uh, to get to know his Jewish, his Jewish heritage. So I'm connected with the Jewish world completely. I'm, I'm, I'm very much in that world. Um, and that's where it gets interesting because, when you're in the 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 Jewish community, you obviously have Zionism completely infiltrated in there. But I'm also pro Palestinian, so that that's where things get really weird. You know what I mean? Yeah, is that American, and it's like because uh, I'm actually really curious uh, with American Jews and the American Jewish community is is Zionism like a hundred percent? Like, uh, is there a, a large amount that are non-Zionists, or is that really just a small minority at this point? <sighs> Unfortunately, even though I was naive enough to think that maybe what you just said was correct, that it was, might be a small minority, I am realizing how much efforts and propaganda that Israel has done to infiltrate the Jewish community to such an extent that they've made sure that the Jewish communities, at least the, the yeah, most of the Jewish communities are, are Zionist. Mm -hmm. And that's just because, that's just, due to their efforts and it's unfortunate for me to say that because i don't want to say that I, I would like to say that no it's a it's a minority but it's fortunately it's not yeah and i but but the beautiful thing about this day and age that we're living in right now is be due to palestinians creating a safe corridor for jews to leave zionism we are seeing a miracle happen and despite all the bad shit that we're seeing right now here's one miracle we're getting out of this we're seeing a schism, a very stark, definite schism happening in the Jewish community where finally Jews can finally feel safe to leave Zionism and not feel guilty about it, not feel like they're hurting anybody. And guess who Guess who are the ones who have knocked the lock off with the sledgehammer and opened up the, the jail bar doors for these Jews to leave Zionism? Palestinians. Palestinians are saving Judaism. And that's just crazy when you think about it. Like Palestinians are saving Judaism. They're saving the soul of Judaism. They're, they, they're, they broke open the lock. They opened the, the cage doors open. They said, come on, get the fuck out of there. It's terrible in there. You're, you're, under, you're under confinement. Get out of there. It's, it, it, the grass is very green over where we're at. We're not going to be anti-Semitic towards you. We're not going to hate you because you're Jewish. You are safe with us, but get out of that Zionist prison. And we are seeing this beautiful split. Happen. And you're saying that happened after Just. October 7th. After October 7th. So you're 7th. noticing that with so, your, like even in whatever Jewish circles you're in, you're noticing that not just on social, but like you've, you've kind of witnessed that you're seeing more people feel comfortable, not scared about 
being Jewish and non-Zionist, even if it is a small minority. I am, I, 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 I am seeing it. I am seeing it now. It may be subtle in certain circumstances, yeah. but um, what's going to wind up happening if I had to, if I had to speculate, I would say that this um, split happening is going to be very. Uh, it's going to be very um, nasty. Mm. This split in in the Jewish community. It's it's gonna it's not going to be pretty. Uh, they're going to be. It, it's going to be very hateful, obviously, on the Zionist side, and you're going to have a point where they're just not going to associate with each other at all. Right now, it's like you're seeing them slowly leave, and maybe they still have connections with the, the Zionist Jewish communities, just just as a standard. Yeah. Just because you know, but I'm I'm thinking eventually it's going to be a very very um uh what's the word um i don't know very uh um, unapologetic sport. yeah but very divisive but it's necessary the the jewish community needs to go through this because if the palestinians have to go through what they're going through this is nothing for the jewish community like this is nothing like it, it's just a necessary thing but to me the beautiful part is, is that it's the Palestinians who are making it safe for Jews to leave Zionism. It's nobody else because evangelical Christians, they're definitely not making it safe for Jews to leave Zionism. Yeah. They're they're guilting any Jew. They're, they're calling them self-hating Jews. The Palestinians are saying, hey, look, you want to be Jewish? That's great. We love Jews. No problem. But get out of Zionism. And And Jews are like, Jews who felt like they couldn't do that before are like, shit okay i have a warm community to go through once i to go to once i once i leave zionism yeah and to me that's just who who else but the palestinians could do that <laughs> like you know what i mean only the palestinians could pull off that type of miracle man and that's why i i'm palestinians never cease to amaze me man every single day i'm seeing something happening in the world despite all the bad stuff happening to them they never cease to amaze me of them of the of the miracles they can they can pull off in this world. Like this this whole world has become Palestine, yeah. and who who else but the Palestinians could do shit like that? Nobody, can, that. you know. And it. Do you feel like uh, are you an optimist or a pessimist? What's your outlook on the future? Of do you think that Greater Israel is gonna most likely come true? Do you like what is your outlook? Do you feel like yeah? What's your outlook on all that? Uh, it's funny. I was actually going to ask ask you that. That was on my list of questions to ask. Okay. You. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, you know what? I, I'm going to throw. The, I'm, I'm, I I want to hear your answer first. Um, my answer. I am. I feel like, and I was actually talking. I've I've gotten really into politics. Like I've uh, because I, I started my nonprofit, and I actually am working with the, the U.S. State Department right now, actually, um, on some settler sanctions. Right. And I was talking to one of um my colleagues at the state department i was like dude like what what do you do you think a palestine is ever even going to be real and he told me that the chances are slim and that if anything's going to happen it has to happen very quickly and i think that most likely i i feel like it's so up in there but it were it's going to be the next five years that determine the future and i think that if the not just the Palestinians and the diaspora, but if more people don't wake up within the next five years, then Israel is going to kind of have its way. However, long term, I don't see this is the thing because I started when you read the stats on how many young people are more are in America are supportive of the Palestinians. I mean, every single uh, Israel needs America. And when I look at these stats, I'm like, well, policy towards Israel is definitely going to change over the next 20 years. So how is that going to happen? You know, and it, it, how is that going to play out for Israel? I I feel optimist enough to keep working towards a Palestinian state that I'm never going to give up on. Like I, I wake up every day and I still think that's possible. So overall, I, I feel pretty optimistic, but I'm rushing myself. I feel optimistic with a with like some fire on my on my feet, if that makes sense. Like I'm really trying to rush to make sure I do everything I can to make things go in the right direction. Uh, so I tried, I guess, like an optimist realist. But when you look at things without taking that all into consideration with how imbalanced the power dynamic is, it, it can it's pretty daunting and scary. I don't know. I guess, yeah, I try to be more optimist. So here's my outlook. The irony about that question directed towards me is what gives me, what makes me optimistic 
you're a you're a huge factor in that. You're a you you direct you personally, right? Right, you on the screen right now. You are the reason why I am optimistic because I like I said I see you as a harbinger. You know, um, I, I I mean that, and I'm not I'm not lying. I'm not I'm not just you know um you know I'm not just uh, simping for you here. I'm I'm being I'm being one hundred percent honest with you. I people like you are the reason why I'm I'm optimistic. It's not because of I I have no faith in politics. I have no faith in there's the, we I think we got to get out of this messiah complex <laughs> that we're, we're going to have some type of like savior come up in Washington and change uh -oh. things. It's not going to happen. They're bought and paid for. The system is rigged against that happening. So there's no hope there and I will I will put nothing on on that hope. Now, I'm that being said, I completely will never discourage anybody from trying to politically uh, change things. I, I'm, I'm not just saying that. I'm just saying that me personally, I, I have no, I have zero faith in politics as far as like the people up in Washington. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the, that's the same type of mentality that that got us wrapped in people like Obama and then Trump and then Biden. It's the same cycle. It's like we think there's going to be a Messiah to to save us from the last Antichrist that that, that came about. You They're know, before him, yeah. Exactly. So I'm definitely pulling out of that cycle of thinking. But um, that being said, people like you, people who are innovative, people who are thinking outside the box, who are being creative, who are figuring out ways how from different angles, how can we tackle this? How can we take down the system? You, I real, I kind of see you as a, an archetype, uh, and I and I think that there are a lot of people like you out there that we don't even know about and that's in a good way in a good way that's terrifying like that's terrifying for the zionist machine to think that there are you times a hundred thousand there's a hundred thousand of you out there or more that are uh, that are just who are not hateful people like you're not hateful at all there's not a i don't see a hateful bone in your body i don't see an anti-semitic bone in your body i don't see a racist bone in your body i, I see a a, a a guy who's hopeful about things who are who's just wants to stand up for justice for his own people and that is lethal because yeah. you could nobody could ever label you as an extremist you know yeah. uh, or and this young generation especially in the next 20 years they're definitely not going to la label you as a, as a as an extremist or a terrorist now the old fucks who are running shit they'll definitely call you a, a guy like you a, a terrorist a terrorist sympathizer yeah. um uh, an extremist uh, an anti-semite there's going to be all kinds of old fucks who are going to be saying that to people like you, but who gives a fuck? They're going to be dying. They're going to be killing over from a heart attack pretty soon. You know, it, it's the younger generation and the younger generation is smart. This Gen Z, they are freaking smart as much shit as the boomers get, give them, um, calling them lazy and, and, and uneducated. It's like every, what do they say? Every accusation is a, is a confession. Yeah, they see right well, the this BS. young exactly so people like you are going to be um i see you guys i see people like you as the uh what's the word uh as jesus said the the mustard seed that's that's now in the ground and it's about to grow and sprout into more mustard plants and, and just you know bloom so uh, that's why i'm optimistic it's not for any logistical reason i am not optimistic for any logistical purpose i i i, I don't see the israeli you know, uh, apartheid, racist, genocidal machine operating for too much longer, not because they don't have all the logistical means to continue it, because they do. They they basically have everything working for them. They got the politicians. They got the tech companies. They even got the Arab states yeah. working for them. So, yeah, all three of those things, and all I mean, all those things that they got working for them, even with all of that, I do not see them pulling through because we've seen time and time again, like you think of everything that's facing, uh, that's, that's, you, you see all that the Palestinians are up against and yet look how much they have pushed through that. Like, yeah. like despite the, the murders uh, of these, of these, and, and, the, and just the, the horror that's happening to the Palestinians in, 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 in Gaza and the West bank still, still, the Palestinians are shining through. They're shining through the darkness. And I'm just like, I, so I guess 
my 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 optimism is i is the belief in 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 miracles and I, but i'm seeing miracles happen before my eyes yeah you know and i don't know how much faith has played a role with you personally but i do know that faith has been one of the key things for the palestinians to bring them through all this they're they're so they are so uh steadfast in, in that faith you absolutely know? i think that uh what i what i've learned is the power and i know this sounds so corny but i i think it's so important to just have hope and not just have hope but uh, uh what gets me going every day when i act and i'm working on all my initiatives and uh, i'm i'm advocating on everything is i have a very clear vision of what i'm trying to see like i actually have because uh, I realistically, until Israel, until something changes, I'm never going to be allowed to go back to see my family in the West Bank. They'll probably kill me on the spot. Uh, they know my social media; yep. they're tracking me. <laughs> so they're, yep. I'm not. I'm not going to be going yep. back. But I have this vision uh, because Yitzar. I have this vision of my cousin actually, because I'm. Really, I've gotten really close to her, holding a uh, Palestinian flag on a stick and uh, sticking it down in the mountaintop of Yitzar when that settlement's dismantled. I, I like sleep and dream this vision. I imagine the wind hitting her. I imagine how the pole is gonna feel. I imagine hearing the dirt just like crunch as she sticks it in. I've gotten psycho with how vivid i have this vision every single night i'm sleeping on this honestly i'm just like imagining her face sticking that and just seeing that settlement gone uh and i think that that you, you know your brain can't tell the difference between a uh, an imagination and a memory and i think that because i believe that so much my actions are a reflection of my belief system you'll hear a lot of people say shit, yeah. but they don't actually do anything on it and I can, what I've realized is that the people that say they believe something, but don't act on it, don't actually believe it. Uh, because it's not just, you know, mi miracles and fairy dust. There has to be action behind everything. Mm -hmm. And if you really are a man of what you say and you really believe something, then the action is effortless. Um, so my mindset is because I have that vision and I'm trying to share my vision with everybody that I meet and I'm trying to remind everybody, like you said, you don't need to rely on the government to do a lot of this stuff. You really don't. You no. have to be smart. You have to play, you have to think outside the box. But I mean, it's it's all possible. I, I'm i I'm pretty crazy in how much I believe in myself. I really think I can change the world, dude. And I hope everybody thinks they can change the world. I don't care how corny that sounds. I really think that before I die, I can make a dent on this planet. And I want every Palestinian. I don't think you can. I think I think you will. Uh, I, to me, I'm I'm far past the idea of thinking that you can. I I think you already are. And I I realize that it you know you're a social media influencer. The problem with social media influencers is they don't really see the impact that they're having to all the people that are watching their videos because you're look you're in a house in Florida. What do you know what's happening? Like what what do you what do you know of what people think about you? Yeah. Right, but. I'm 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 trying to give you an outside perspective on you that I can already say that I, I can I can tell with very confidently that you are that you are going to change the world not that you can or you have the potential um uh but I I think I know that you will well I appreciate it and I and I mean honestly I I, I want to uh actually I heard I, I I somebody told me this and I, I loved it they said um may you uh, stand on the shoulders of your ancestors and change the world in their honor. And every so that's where it all come from. It has so so little to do about me and so much to do about pushing the cause forward. And I think that what will change my optimism comes from seeing mobilizing more people towards this. I think what more people need to start to build is hope and have that vision. So I just try to share that vision because if you can get people to see it, I mean, even in, in basketball and in the NBA, they would all, the coaches would always have them actually do visualization techniques. There's, there's a science behind it to actually seeing what you're trying to work towards. And I think right now, what a lot of people need is actually a vision of a free Palestine uh, and actually imagine yes. what that is and then acting on that. And that's where I, I can I, I can get annoying with how much I tell people we need to act on our belief system. And that can be even the smallest action forward makes such a big difference when you think about the millions and billions of people on this planet. Uh, so yeah. uh, I feel I feel really, really hopeful. I feel like 
I'm always rushing in my life because I, I'm 27, so I know I'm still super young. But dude, I my my brain works really weird. I keep thinking about how much I still want to get done before I die, so I'm always trying to hustle to get it all done. Uh, and, yeah. And um, so yeah. I feel hopeful. I think there's. I think that it's going to be very interesting seeing the next 10 years for America, honestly, and America's relationship with Israel. I think that's going to be interesting to see how things play out especially with the younger generation taking more, you know, higher forms of leadership as, as, as time goes on. Um, I think that it would, and I, I've, and I, when I tell this to people, they think it's, it's a, a weird thought, but I genuinely think America would be a better country and a stronger country if America was, it had better allyship with Middle Eastern countries instead of Israel, or at least made it fair. Mm-hmm. And actually, President um, Eisenhower said this very, very early on when Israel was still a baby. He said that he never wants to put Israel on a pedestal to where it alienates the United States from the Arab world. And that's that's too far gone at this point. Um, but so when I talk about my yeah. dream for a free Palestine, I'm thinking of how we can actually make that happen. So that's why I talk a lot about the eco- economics of it on in a lot of my videos. And I talk about you know, the industries we need to focus on and getting Palestinians in the West Bank employed and doing all of this because uh, being recognized as a state, what I've realized is if you can create, basically when uh, when the United Nations and whatever decides a country is a country, all that they're doing is just labeling it. But if you have every aspect of a country and you're not labeled yet, you're not far off from becoming a country. So my focus is just creating every single aspect of a country and then eventually the sticker is going to come. So what I mean by that is, okay, let's yeah. boost the economy here. Let's get these people jobs. Let's do this. Yeah. And these are all things we don't need a government to do for us. We can do all of this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so that's where a lot of that yeah. motivation comes because I feel like there's uh, there's infinite things left to do, and I don't I don't want to judge the outcome until I felt like I've done everything I can. And ultimately, that you know, that's there's so much left to be done. I think I feel pretty optimistic when you consider all of that. Yeah. I, and, and that's, again, that's what struck me with you is I can see that in your face. I see that in your videos. I see it in your aura, your general aura um, is that, and that that's why it's, uh, you've been a big inspiration, you know, and it's been a, it's, it's an honor to, to actually talk to you in more depth about this stuff. It really is an honor for me. Um, and I, I also, you know, and it was funny. I, one of the things on the notes that I wanted to talk to you about was um, you touched on it is this idea see right now uh the political the economic system is rigged against us obviously right so my solution is or my idea that i've had for a while for a long time now is let's create a parallel economic system to compete with theirs right and i've often for years i've been wondering like how can we patronize um palestinian business Mm -hmm. you know palestinian economics how do we patronize that um, how do we tap into it? How do we b- bolster it? Because, okay, um, if the Israelis are going to um, try and cut them off from the world economy, yeah. let's, pl- let's plug them into a backdoor system, right? Um, and so I think that's one of the greatest threats to um, the Zionist system is if we create a parallel economy because, we're, uh, because they have a monopoly. I mean, the same... The same evil forces behind oppressing the Palestinians are the same forces that are behind screwing over your average American. With everything that's going on in the Americans, like all the struggles that we have as American, inflation going up, the cost of housing, all that stuff can be traced back. If you trace it up the chain, it goes back to the same uh, monopoly forces that are bolstering Israel and the Zionist machine. It's the same enemy. Yeah. At the end of the day, the same pyramid, the same pyramidal structure. So I'm like, okay, so therefore the struggle for the Palestinians is the struggle of all of us. When you really do, and this is not, I'm not being hyperbolic. It's literally, if you if you trace the finances and trace the economic mechanisms going on, it, it, it all goes to back to the same spot. So what you're talking about is revolutionary and it's something that we really need to focus on. And I think that with minds like yours out there, merging ah 
the, it's it's the game over. It's gonna happen. You yeah, know? no, I feel I, I I feel good about that. And I love thinking about the economics of it because I've told this to a few friends and I get weird faces when I bring this up. But I honestly think that everything is uh, what I've realized and is that the world runs on money and power. Like I've I've known that, but the past mm-hmm. since October seventh, I know that. Like I know that very very clearly. And I think that a lot of people. Uh, a, a, a decent amount of people, they try to ignore the fact that the world runs on money and power and think that the world is fair and just. And they, 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 they won't accept the reality that the world runs on money and power and you have to make decisions with that knowledge in mind. I think that's what trips a lot of people up is they, they refuse to accept that so they don't take that into consideration with their decision making. I'm the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. I don't have time to play with bullshit and think about justice and stuff and try to, you know, I want to know, I want to have all the real data. And when I, as an entrepreneur, what I've realized is that if the world runs on money and power, it doesn't matter how crazy these religious fanatics are. If you have a better offer, you know, the money and power is going to, it's going to take it. So I really think that, and what I'm trying to do when I talk about a free Palestine and it comes to the economics of it, I really think that the West Bank can be positioned as like the second India and what I mean by that is positioning the West Bank as a yeah. telecommunications hub because there's really not much mm. uh, and because you know the settlers destroy they the only industries in the West Bank are really olive harvests that's that's the primary industry in agriculture well the 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 settlers in the West Bank uh, have done a great job making it impossible for them to harvest their oil their all their uh, olive oil so I've been trying to think of ways we can get these people employed that they can do from home that the settlers can't, you know, take away from them. And that's where I'm like, okay, well, you know, there's internet access in the West Bank. Labor is very cheap. Even if you give them a fair deal in comparison, it's still incredibly cheap for U.S. businesses. So I'm like, well, you know, if, if we're having all of these mega businesses, uh, you know, source their labor out to the Philippines, to India, let's just get these Palestinians employed as well and do the same thing. So that's why my focus has been trying to teach more Palestinians English trying to get them to learn chat GPT. I've been really teaching Palestinians like get access to chat GPT. There's so much online nope. work you can do. AI. AI ex- exactly. There's so Bro. much online work they, uh, they can do. So that's been a big focus of mine is trying to sell the West Bank as an investment deal. Um, and I think it's possible. I think that people, it, People have to rethink the way they view the West Bank. But I mean, there's 2 million Palestinians there. That's a lot of labor, you know. And right now, the, these people are building their own demise. The majority of settlement construction is done by Palestinians in the West Bank. Isn't, that's that's insane to think. And I, I'm not blaming them, you know, at, at all. Uh, not, what is it? Yeah, I mean, they're they're what are, they're in poverty. What like, are they going to do, you know? And I guess they're selling their souls for 25 bucks a day. That's how much these settlement construction mm-hmm. is paying them because the Palestinian economy is so much lower. The settlers purposely mm-hmm. try to ruin their economy to force them into settlement construction. And what I try to mm-hmm. tell Americans is because, I, you know, Americans say, oh, well, you know, that's what they get for kind of building their own downfall. Well, here in America, you know, private equity are buying all of these homes like crazy. And we yep. know that it's 40 percent, 40, 40, 40 percent of that, homes yeah, are, uh, are are owned by ultimately BlackRock. BlackRock owns BlackRock and Vanguard and State Street own 40% of America. So, and let's say right now, you know, you had a home and you were about to sell it and then you have a private equity firm come up to you. They're obviously going to give you like an amazing offer and you have, you know, you're, you know, you have a, another a small family that's also competing. I, I'm sure you could probably be the kindest person ever, but if you're getting an all cash offer, you're just going to take the deal, even though, you know, it's going to lead to a worsening American economy because you just have to do what you have to yeah. do to take care of your family. And it's really the same concept there. Exactly. So I'm just trying to figure out a way to pitch the West Bank as a investment opportunity for the Western world. That's been my that's kind of my undertaking right now. Dude, I if what dude, you need anything from me, bro. I'm your, <laughs> I'm your boy. Like I mean, not that I not that I'm like uh that much of an asset, but oh, fuck, I, I mean, it. anything I could I could do, I'll 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 because I've been thinking about the same shit for years. Like I've always thought about like Okay, we're talking about the Holy Land, right? Palestinians have been the caretakers of the Holy Lands for thousands of years. They like they know how to indu- they know how to how to um uh, uh provide the products 
that 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 the Holy Land has to offer more than anybody else who comes to try to settle that land does. Yeah. So let's work on that strength that the Palestinians have. They have a lot to offer the world, but they're being shut off from it. And I, I think it's because Israel knows that potential that's out there for the Palestinians, and they're deathly afraid of it. Yeah. I think they're deathly afraid of what you're talking about. Yeah, they're afraid of knowing. They're afraid of the world knowing the truth. And actually, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the it's it's been a Muslim mm. uh, Palestinian family that's been that's been holding the keys to that church for for decades, to maintaining that church every day. Every day they un they go up and unlock it for the Christians. yeah exactly. Uh, and Palest I mean, Muslims and Christians have no in, in Jerusalem, especially. It's very like. You, Palestinians, Muslims, and Jewish people have lived in that land for centuries, completely peaceful. Okay, and uh, mm -hmm. and I was talking to my, like I said, I was talking to my mom about this, and it wasn't until the Zayuni, the Zionists came, and the Arab Jews at the time, the Mitzrahi Jews, they 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 weren't they they hadn't they didn't have this sort of mindset, and also they all of them spoke Arabic, so the resurgence of Hebrew as a language, uh, the you know everybody becoming a Zionist, Arab Jews now not wanting to call themselves Arabs and, you know, and completely isolating themselves. This all happened 1940, when Israel was, a, was, was born. And that's, yeah. and that's what's really interesting to me. It's, it's really sad, but um, think, yeah, things will change. It's just some. Um, well, yeah, it's because it's Zionists monopolized Jewry and, and Judaism and, and the Jewish community. They monopolized it through intimidation through through shaming uh i've i've heard um that uh, one of the dramas that happens in the jewish community especially regarding the uh, ashkenazi and the uh, and the sephardic and mizrahi jews was the fact that ashkenazi jews would guilt uh or that not all of ashkenazi jews but there would be a lot of zionist ashkenazi jews who would guilt the mizrahi and sephardic jews for not having to have gone through the holocaust so they would oh. be, they would be like you know what yeah that that was that was a thing in a lot of zionist jewish communities is that ashkenazi jews would tell would kind of give off this uh clicky attitude towards mizrahis and being like well you guys didn't have to go through the holocaust you were able to just skirt by in the arab territories while we had to go through the holocaust that was one of the guilt the tools of guilt that they would use towards brown skinned jews and uh, it was one of the ways that they were able to kind of throw a lasso around the Mizrahi Jewish community and pull them into Zionism by guilting them into it. It was really fascinating when I heard that by, and by the way, I heard that from one of my Sephardic Jewish friends and who, you know, who is aware of the racism that goes on within synagogues uh, that is directed towards, you know, brown skinned Jews, you know, but um, uh, I, you know, I'm completely on board with what you're saying, bro. And, and I've been f having the same sentiments and feeling the same sentiments for a long time. And so when I saw your videos, um, I was like, damn, like that, it was a, it was that kindred spirit that kind of clicks, you know, when you, when you see somebody who's thinking along the same lines, like, I got to talk to this guy, I got to get him on the podcast. I wonder if he'll even respond to my <laughs> DMs, but hey, thank God you did, bro. I, I, I was, I was really honored that you, uh, responded to me on that, you know, and, um, and now we kind of went down a whole rabbit hole, Yeah. but I want to climb out of the, I want to climb back to, um, the West bank a little bit. Um, you showed me one of the videos. Did you have another one you want? Yeah, I think I, I put it in there when they kidnapped her son. Oh yeah. So that I was there, I was literally in the building next door, and all we heard was the screaming. So we they sent us this video afterward. But what the uh, what the IDF are saying is when is what which is where's the boy, and they kept saying where's the boy, and the mom keeps responding saying there there is no boy, there is no boy, please is, he's just a baby, please there's no boy, just leave leave. The nine year old boy. Yeah, and the only reason they took him is because this kid this kid was literally playing outside in his in his front yard, and when the IDF stormed when I sent, when you played that other video where they were walking down the road. 
they saw him and then he runs back inside and they're like, all right, let's just grab this one. And this is, this is the thing they do. This is their, this is what they do. This is their tactic. They'll find a young boy. They'll grab him. It could be for literally no reason, beat the shit out of him, release him the next day, kind of as like a statement to all of the other young men, like, see how we beat the hell out of this dude. We'll do the same to any of y'all. Yeah. And uh, that really, and this again, this is literally my first two hours, I guess, while I was there. I'm seeing all of this, and I'm hearing all of this. Um, that that in every single context is what you would call terrorism. Yeah, that is the definition of terrorism. You can't label that any other way besides terrorism and sadism. Sadism, terrorism. It's, it's sadistic terrorism, is what that is. 